The next talk is a social sciences talk. Um, it will be given by Lucie Dalibert. She's a lecturer at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences of the Claude Bernard University in Lyon. Her research focuses on how biomedical technologies are shaping our bodies and, uh, and our health. Thank you, Amin. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to present. It's not always that you can mix uh, approaches and and to have an interdisciplinary way of approaching a topic. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I don't know. Can you hear me at the back? Uh, no, microphone is better. Yeah, Microphone's yeah. better. All right. I have a tendency to move a lot my hands, so I'll try to keep it in front of my mouth. Um, so when Amin invited me, I had it was a bit difficult for me also to think about would I find something interesting for you guys to talk about. So I will present some bits and pieces of my research, past and present, which I hope will well be resonate a bit with what you're doing and maybe be a bit inspiring. I do not know. But uh, just to present myself, I am an uh, assistant professor at the University of uh, Claude Bernard Lyon, like Amin said. I work indeed on the question of embodiment and especially how biomedical bio technologies are shaping bodies and our being in the world and also our notions of health and disability. I'm a philosopher or I have a PhD in philosophy of technology. However, I also do field work, meaning that I go do interviews and observations with people working in the field, engineers, doct medical doctors, and, uh, and people living with the technologies. So I've been working on spinal cord stimulation here. I've done field work during my PhD thesis on it. And also I have a new project at the moment on prosthetics, in which it started at the end of last year, and we have two postdocs on the project, Valentin Gourina and Paul Fabien Grou. And we're working, we're questioning a lot of people after one or two years after they're back at home from, back home from the rehabilitation center, stop using their prosthesis. The older you get, the less you use it. So we try to, our question is what happens here in the appropriation process in the rehabilitation. And we question a bit the use of, of amputees, the practices also of professionals, and this question of appropriation and of um, lived experiences here. So this is something, I will not talk about that, but this is something that exists uh, at the moment. There's also, we also have a bit of a publicity. We have a research group that's called Bodies and Prosthesis, or Core et Prothèse, that um, brings together several uh, researchers from different disciplines and different uh, um, universities also. So we have people who are anthropologists and philosophers from the University of uh, Lyon 1. We also have roboticists from uh, the Isir in Paris. We also have some people working more in literature from Grenoble. And we organize seminars in which we do a bit the same as what you're doing here, which is trying to cross different gazes or perspective on one topic. So we always try to bring not only professionals, but also engineers, and especially people who are living or experiencing the technologies. We generally when we talk on technology, I come from the human enhancement field. Nobody even asks people what it means to be living with a, with a very close uh, technology. So this is this. Nothing happened in 2020 because of the coronavirus. We hope that we can resume our activity in 2021. Um, so today I will be, like I said, talking a bit about uh, bits and pieces of my research. I'll especially be wondering what it takes, in a way, to be living with a technology that acts on and intervenes in, uh, in bodies. This was my PhD thesis, so that's what I will be relying on. And the second one is a new book that has been published in 2020 and asks the question of resilience that people have to create in order to live with pacemakers and implanted cardiac defibrillators. And I find the notion of resilience quite interesting because while coping is very psychological and insisting on the individual, Resilience also shows that at the end, it's not just the individual, you also have a lot of social, mater social material network of people and of human and non-human actors, let's say. It's a lot more. It's not just somebody who's able to cope, but it depends on a lot more uh, things. Um, if I speak too fast also, please uh, just wave and I'll, I'll slow down. Um, so. I will start with some field work that I've done in the field of spinal cord stimulation. I think in 2012 in the Netherlands, I don't think I will teach you anything about spinal cord stimulation, but the one I studied was used for uh, 
chronic neuropathic pain, which means that uh, the, neuro the, the technology consisted of an implant that was an electrode that was put on the lower part of the spinal cord, a pulse generator that was either implanted on the lower part of the abdomen or on the upper part of the buttock, and also a remote control that enabled people to change programs depending on where throughout the day or depending on the activities they would feel pain, because chronic neuropathic pain is pain in the legs and in the feet. And also maybe to increase the stimulation in order to lower the pain level. It's a last resort technology, and it's not something that cures the cause of the pain, but just manages or treats uh, the, the sensation. And it, it, that is, it doesn't stop pain, but it replaces it by a more pleasant sensation, as they say, which is paresthesia. And people describe it as pins and needles or tingling, which is in the legs and, uh, and, and feet. There are new paradigms appearing now, such as burst stimulation, which sends a lot of energy at the same time, uses the battery a lot, but apparently people do not feel even the tingling sensations. However, something to be said, at the time at which I was doing my research, the pulse generator was non-rechargeable, meaning that it had to be replaced every seven years. So if you have burst stimulator that uses a lot of energy, well, also you have to go have be operated and have it replaced a lot more. Um, so for me, something that interests me is what does it mean to live with spinal cord stimulation, but also what does it mean to be living with chronic neuropathic pain? We have questionnaires and indexes to describe it, medically speaking, but what does it mean for people living with it? So for instance, I have three men describing what they feel. Uh, Mr. Koopman, <coughs> who's 53 years old at the time, and he explains, the pain that I have in my feet is constant. I'm always in the south of France, along the river, on pools on pebbles with my bare feet. So you should imagine walking on, on that. But well, I also have a lot of flashy shooting pains in my feet and toes, and often I have cold feet. feet. Mr. Mulder, 57, is saying that what he has is a burning pain on the feet, like you're stepping on a rope constantly, constantly. I didn't sleep at night, four times a night I had to go out of bed because of so much pain. And Mr. Meyer, 56, is explaining that it's like walking on glass, on broken glass. It's oof. So walking is full of pain. I can't walk on sand on the beach. It doesn't work. When I go under the shower or go swim, the water hurts. The pain is inside all the time. At home, I am always walking on slippers. Shoes are not possible anymore. When I'm in bed, the blanket is on my feet. Otherwise, I can't sleep. I can't, handle, I can't handle anything at my feet. Everything hurts. Socks, shoes, everything. So as expressed by these three men, the pain is ceaseless. There is no respite from it. And they also express it quite vividly by um, um, yeah, bringing some particular elements. We have pebbles, we have glass, we have some ropes on which you're constantly um, 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 walking. And the thing is that living with chronic neuropathic pain is not just having these sensations all the time and just having this body, bodily feeling. It has also a strong impact on what's being in the world. That is that you have people, it's um, Mr. Van Houten, 61, who explains that I am in a lot of pain. I'm always lying in bed or sitting in a wheelchair all day. And I sit down and I look outside. I don't do anything. Maybe, yes, get some coffee at home. So the chronic pain also impairs people from doing anything. When they were telling me about their day, they said, well, I have the energy or the strength to prepare my breakfast, but then I have to stop, lie down. Maybe I can prepare lunch, but maybe I cannot. So it's, really, it's very much a disabling um, condition. In terms of um, to understand a bit this kind of, uh, of way of experiencing pain in one's body and also one's body with technology, I've been looking at um, some philosophical work, and also thinking at, the, at bodies and illness, but we could also think about bodies and pain or bodies and disability. When we're in good health or without pain, we always experience our body as an absence, as an absent presence. It's not there. In daily interaction, we do not think about our body. It's not something that becomes the object of an attention when you're in good health and we're not in pain. And it's uh, Vivian Sobchak, for instance, that explains most of the time, most of us walk to the door without a thought. And as we walk, we think thoughts without a thought of the body that transparently makes not only our walking, but also our thoughts possible. Vivian Sobchak is a, is a woman, a researcher who also uh, has a lower leg amputation and also explain what it takes to be able to walk and live with such a prosthesis. 
And so the body in health or without pain, the pain-free body is also characterized by intentionality. It's directed outside of itself and by agency. This is something, it's marked by an I can, I can do things. What Rouleder says is that however, in chronic illness or in pain, the body is experienced as an absence, absence. The body is there at the forefront of uh, the consciousness and the attention. It disappears with a why. So it is experienced as a, as a very strange, alien, and disturbing presence. It's a researcher, Zeller, who says, I no longer experience that I am, that I am my body. It's no longer transparent, but that I have a body. It becomes an object. For Scary, she talks about pain as being not only a, transforma a, tr a transformation, but even a destruction of the world. It prevents you from being able to project yourself, from being able to make projects, from being able to make plans. You have to think about how you feel in the day to be able to think of what could be possible that day. And for them, the, the world of people living in chronic pain is characterized by I cannot. There is a lack of agency. Like I was telling you, these people who, during the day, they wake up, they can prepare breakfast, but then everything becomes very painful and very difficult. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes? Are we allowed to ask a question? Yes, you may. Uh, um, I'm surprised by the, let's say the, the idea of the transparent bully, mm -hmm. in the sense that if you ask, for example, the petit rat de l'Oubira, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there are also their body is here and there is a task that they are not able to achieve and they feel their body all the day long, right? So the body is not transparent at all. So it seems that the, the common point between a petit rat de l'opéra and a person that has lost some part of his ability is to uh, want to go out of what he can do. So as soon as you are, uh, so there is uh, let's say a set of tasks that you are able to do and then the body can become transparent, but as soon as you want to escape from this set of tasks, then the body, uh, if you are able, or uh, let's say uh, sportive, the haut niveau, or high level sportive, uh, as soon as you want to escape or do something new, mm -hmm. then the body will become not transparent at all. It will become very present. It becomes something, the, the direction of your attention, the difference between someone who's doing it for sports, like a, a, a person dancing at the opera and somebody who's in chronic pain, is that one chooses to at some point confront the body and gives attention to it, and the other ones do not. That's something that is always, always in their attention and they, cannot they can't switch it off. Whereas the, the dancer, the moment that she stops dancing, the pain is no longer here, the attention can disappear. Well, when, when you hear Petit Rado Luka, it seems that since they are 13 or even sooner, uh, always there. So the attention to the body, but I don't think in terms of even there is a difference of degree and of quality mm. here. She, she chooses, she's in good health, actually her body is not a hindrance, she's trying to push it, and that's something I'll go back towards. At the, mm. I have a second part also on my talk where I talk about um, prosthetics and this idea of also pushing the body beyond its limits, but I truly believe that it's not really comparable to somebody who chooses while having a perfectly able body and someone who actually is reminded all the time of the presence of the body in a painful way and cannot escape it. I think even if there is the attention, the, the, the quality of it is not the same. Um, so we have bodies indeed when in chronic pain or in chronic illness are characterized by um, I cannot. This is, these are the insights uh, from philosophy or philosophy of the body. And the thing is that uh, the implantation, because of this past also of living in chronic pain, and pe people also have been uh, using a lot of medication before, opioids, mainly anticonvulsants, which also strong effects, a lot of them I didn't include um, their talks, but talk about my mind was flat, I was not able to do anything. So there's a past of not being able to do anything. And here what they say after the implantation, so the moment when the pain is replaced by this tingly feeling, um, there is some sort of rewarding. All, all of a sudden, the world changed color or change uh, of, of nature. So again, Mr. Van Houten, 61 years old, said, it changed my life, what I can do and how I feel. When I don't have this, I am in a lot of pain. That's, what's, that's the quote of before. I'm always lying in bed or I'm sitting in a wheelchair all day. And I sit down and I look outside. I don't do anything. Maybe, yes, get some coffee at home. And now I can go outside. I can go shopping. I can take care of my husband. And when I don't have this, he talks about the technology, yeah, then I can do nothing. I can say now that I belong somewhere, that I am now part of the life. 
Mr. Mayor, 56, is talking about, is telling that I've been very, very active after the implantation. And here is with his wife, and both of them are laughing. I went swimming again, I went working again at 100%. I became a board member of a patient association. It changed my life 100%. And here we also have, um, um, or let's say that the difference also is not just that it stops the, the, pain, the painful sensations to be here, but the, the transformation, the drastic change with the technology is the fact that it enables them to be able to do things. And for them, it's being back. I like the expression of uh, Mr. Van Houten to be part of life again, to be able to project this himself. He can take care of his husband. He can prepare things. He can do things. This is something that goes back uh, in terms of how they explain um, so their life world becomes characterized by agency and by the idea of being able to do things, especially after years of disabling uh, pain and pain medication. And Mrs. Blumen also says that yes, yes, it improves things in her daily life a lot. I can walk better, I can walk better longer. Um, four or five years ago, we did go back to France. We've been there 25 years ago with my parents. And the first time there, we climbed the mountain that we could see from the camping. Five years ago, we did it again. We didn't make it quite to the, pot, the top, and here our voice fills up with emotion, but it was um, yeah, a victory that I could do that again, and um, it felt all right. So there is this idea, indeed, of um, when the painful body is no longer at the center of one's attention, then you're able to do things. That's, what, that's really the drastic change for them uh, once the, 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 the technology is, um, is implanted. However, there is something that here I want to say, is that this idea that they can do things, that it's not something that just happens by uh, snapping your finger. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of training. It doesn't, it's not because the technology is implanted that magically everything goes away. And this is something that I uh, want to discuss. So for instance, it's also Nelly Housdorn who talks about the idea of building a body technology alliance. And what we can see is that for the technology to realize its promises um, and become part of people's life, it's absolutely not uh, immediate. On the contrary, it demands quite some work. And I think we talked about learning and adaptation, but here it's really a groping process or, or, or an exploration process, trying to do things with it and see how it feels. So for instance, it's Mr. Uh, Van Houten who talks about the first two, three days, yes, yes, all day, you're just playing with it. Yes, what is possible? Can I drive the car? When you're sitting down and you put it on, so when you switch on the remote control to start the stimulation, oh, that's very nice. And then you go stand up, Phew. yes, and then you must learn higher, what can you do? I put it on and I try and I feel this. So there is really this movement in terms of this very reflexive process of trying, doing movements, trying gestures, doing activities, and this um, oh, very dynamic process between what is it that I feel and what can I do? And when I do this, what do I feel? And this is by doing this that little by little, they are able to make the technology transparent for themselves. Meaning that the technology, what it does, doesn't uh, draw attention to it anymore. So it's Mrs. Jensen, for instance, 63, who tells that in the beginning, I thought I will never get used to it because you constantly feel that trembling in your leg in your legs. And also, if you travel and you sit in the train and the train or the bus drives over a bump, you feel that extra. But at some point, you feel it no more. At what point I sat down and I thought, oh yes, that thing is still on. I didn't feel it at, at all today. But in order to achieve that, that feeling of, I don't feel it anymore, I don't feel it today, it takes indeed that very reflexive process of trying to, of testing anything, of, try, of getting some, no, some, some knowledge and some know-how. It's only after a while, after having tried a lot of things and in many different settings, that people are able to, well, habituate or get used to the technology. And that the technologies become integrated is one, in one's um, bodily model, let's say, of, in terms of movements and sensations. There's also something that I want to say in terms of the, uh, the, the, the quotation that I use. So the fieldwork took place in the Netherlands. I am not a Dutch speaker. I do not speak Dutch. And I was talking to Dutch people who are also quite old. So sometimes the, our English was quite broken. And if there is one thing that's very difficult to talk about in any language, even in his native tongue, in one's native tongue, is one's body and sensations. We generally miss a bit the, the, the words. So there's also that level that appears in the, um, in the, in the citations, in the, in the, ex, in the extracts. Um, so the, the new sensations that are very disoriented at the beginning, having this tingly feeling in one's leg, 
it takes indeed that groping explorative process that's very reflexive in terms of evaluating one's sensation and one's movement and then getting slowly well getting a hold over the technology but also at some point making it disappear but it doesn't disappear on its own it takes people's work and it takes people's effort to make it disappear and that's something that's quite important especially when discussions about technologies in, I came from the field of human enhancement, that's where I started my PhD thesis. This, there is this idea that, oh, let's put an implant in someone's head. I think that's a bit Elon Musk's idea. And it's just magic and there's no problem and it works directly. It's just not, it takes a lot more than that. Um, but this idea also of, uh, of, of, um, of having the technology uh, being transparent also demands something and I think my slide has moved. I believe it's no longer on it. Yeah, it also demands this process of fine tuning. So people have this remote control, but it's not like they can move the electrode on the spine or that they can change the settings. This has to happen at the hospital. And it takes this kind of dance or choreography between the technicians or the nurse and the person. And it's also a very demanding process. You have eight electrodes and they say, OK, if I, if I increase this one or I, I, I heighten I don't know, the amplitude, what do you feel and where do you feel it? So it demands people's very, a lot of attention also to their bodily feeling. That is not something that we're used to. So finding the right settings is something that can be very, very difficult. So once the technology, we got, the people got used to it, they're able to live with it, no longer at the forefront of their attention, does However, does that mean that, um, that people are living well with it, that they're happy with it, that, this is a, that it's not something that is bothering? And here there is also quite a step between this idea of having the technology that's transparent and having it as being part of oneself or one's, or one's body. There is, uh, the technology doesn't need to be just embodied but also incorporated as being part. So that's the question, for instance, I like that quotation, the feeling of ownership that we have of our bodies clearly does not extend, for example, to the fork that we use at dinner. So what does it take at some point to have an implant? I mean, it can be in implanted inside, hidden, or we might not see it all the time, but does that mean that it's experienced as being part of oneself? And that was quite key, actually, for the technology not to be distressing. Because something that is not being seen is that the, the pulse generator is something that's quite big, that's implanted either here or there, and very visible under the skin. You can feel it, you can touch it, and for people that takes a lot of effort to get used to that, and can be also quite uh, distressing. So there's an incorporation process at play here, and it's not something that also people decide to say and look at themselves in the mirror and say, today the technology is part of myself. That's really a lot more complicated. It's also not something that they do alone. They do that um, in relations with others. And to understand that, its body is always double. It's always an object, so something that we see in the mirror, something that others see is the körper, but it's also a lived body, the body that you feel every day, that you experience, your lived experience. And here it's work from uh, Jenny Slatman and uh, uh, Guy uh, Peter Sauven. They've been working on hands transplant. And they were wondering why two men, one, the, the transplants were very well and they were accepted, and the other one, they had to be um, well, removed. He asked them to be removed because he could not take it. He was not able to feel that the hands were uh, themselves. He thought that the color was wrong, that the feel was wrong. He thought that they were the hands of uh, a murderer or a rapist, and also people were telling him that, or maybe that's the hand of a murderer. And for someone else, it was a complete different experience. There were some moments, some symbolical moments that were key in making the technology part of oneself, to be able to identify with the changed body. So, and the, the, the identification is not just visual, but it's also haptic. What do you feel when you touch it? But also very much effective. So, for instance, it was a Chatelier. In a, in, that's one of the person they were um, well looking at, and he explains that he, for him, one key moment was he was a fervent uh, Catholic, and he went to the Vatican, and the Pope shook, shook his hands. And for him, that was the key moment to feel that the hands were actually his hands. And here, in terms of the, when I was asking the people I interviewed through uh, an hour or more about what it felt also, what, was the, what the technology was for them, and a lot of time when they explained that it was there, that it was part of their body, there was always an external element, someone, generally a loved one, that intervened in the story. So here you have Mrs. Uh, Baton, Baton, who explains that, um, that her, grand, her eldest grandchild, who is now 13 years old, knows about it, about the fact that she has spinal cord stimulation. 
he saw it once, so he saw the, the remote control and the pulse generator, and he thinks it's okay. He was part of the process back then, he was 10, so he was part of it, and he first <coughs> takes a peek, and it's almighty interesting, but when they have seen it, it's okay. It becomes a part of grandma. That's the way it is. So for her, she was very comfortable with her body, but also because she had this kind of external validation from people whom she loved, and were also kind of identifying with a changed body. She was still the same, there was nothing to be rejected, there was nothing that was alien here. On the contrary, we have another woman, Mrs. Blumen, and the story is a lot more um, distressing. So the interview was a bit strange. I had my gatekeeper, the person who gave me access to the hospital, and she was also there during the interview, but not only she was also part of the research, but she was also their medical physicist. <laughs> so that made the interaction a bit weird. But also during the interview, uh, the husband of Mrs. Blumen was there. So we have four, peop four people in this interaction. And Mrs. Blumen says, I didn't want that. I didn't want something, and maybe I have to precise that, she says she could not live without the technology. For her, it's a, it's a necessary tool, she would not, she needs it. But she still says, I didn't, want, I, I didn't want that. I didn't want something on my body that doesn't belong there. The remote control, you can place that away and it's gone, she loves. You don't have to think about it, but this, and she talks about the, 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 the pulse generator, this here, it's always there, you can't remove it. And so as to spinal cord stimulation, you don't consider it as part of you. Oh no, no, um, it's a big help for me, but it's still an instrument. And then she starts crying. I don't like it that he, and she, took that, she looks at her husband, can feel it. For, yeah, for, at first, you make jokes about it, but at some point, the fun stops. And here you have Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Blumen's husband who uh, intervened and said, no, but for me, it's easier to see it as a part of her, because without it, she doesn't function that well. That's maybe easier as a partner to get over it than the person itself. And the doctor here says, but because for you, Mrs. Blumen, it's more like an annoying piece of, yes, an annoying thing that's sometimes in the way. And her husband says, yeah, the only time I see it, it's where in bed, to put it bluntly. And I said, yes, yes, I know that, but with clothing, you do have to take into, to account, you have to take it into account. And then you want to be sure that others don't see it. And he says, yeah, but if you wear a skirt or tight pants, you don't see it. Yes, but you have to assume that that's the, you, you, you have to assume that that's the, the case, that people can see it. For her, she was making, she was having this fixation on the fact that people could see her, her, her pulse generator. She was a woman who was very thin, also linked to her chronic disease. Her chronic disease. She had diabetes because of it. She had lost part of her sight, her eyesight. Sight. And for her, the pulse generator was this thing that was completely abject. She could not identify um, with her body because of that. But not for herself. She was also projecting what her husband might feel or what he could see when he was looking at her. But not only her husband, she was also imagining what others could see, that they could see that her body was different from the one of others. And for her, that was extremely distressing. And it was also a bit of a gendered dimension here, where women were a lot more distressed by the change that were happening to their body. So to link to me, I don't have time to enter into that, but generally when we associate technology, it's always with a male body. You just have to look at what is shown when engineers make nice pictures of bodies and technology. It's always the male form. Um, the, the previous Perrin showed that um, it was Terminator. You rarely see women with implanted technologies. That is not something that we imagine. A female body has to be smooth, thin, nice, but certainly not uh, technologized. So there is a bit also of the effort that it takes for women to kind of be able to identify uh, with the body. So what I wanted to show is also to be able to incorporate, to make it one's own, the, the spinal cord stimulation. It, it's a very uh, relational process. But still, and that's how you make this, what uh, Alzon would call this body technology alliance. And you would say, well, but that's nice. When it's done, everything is perfect, right? So the person has been able to embody the technology. She's able to incorporate it too. She should be able to live well with it. Well, it also demands another layer of work, which is not only you have to become close to your technology, but you have also to put away, to disentangle yourself from other pieces of technologies and also other people. So something that kept, re that kept uh, coming back that is what I call a bit of the disruptions that can happen in one's experience with the neuromodulation technology. The moment that it stops being transparent, it stops not only being transparent as in terms of embodiment, but also stops being part of oneself. And they're, all of them were telling me about two things, airport security, the stress of airport security, and um, 
um, security gate in particular shops, there were shops that kept coming back that beeps every time you pass. And for them, this was very much, they were outing technologies. All of a sudden, it's being shown that there is something that is wrong with you and they feel that the body, the technology was transparent, part of themselves, and all of a sudden, because of this hyper visibility, the people are looking and wondering what's happening. They, they, well, they, they are at risk of stigmatization, but also the technology turns no longer in an object for themselves, of themselves, but as an object uh, of the world. Something that is, no, that is strange for others, but also strange for oneself, and that becomes, uh, that demands particular attention. So there are disruptions a bit, um, the disruptions that are linked to the social material environment play also a big role in how you can live well with the technology. Here I'm talking about technologies, but you can also think this was not really the case. They were not, some were taking, well, you have to make sure that the grandchildren are not taking the remote control. Nelly Ardon in her book, she talks also about pacemakers and, um, and ICDs, in, uh, uh, implanted cardiac defibrillators, and she says, you also have to disentangle yourself from others. Like you have children, grandchildren, they don't know that you have something that's on your chest and maybe you're playing with them and might just hit it. So there is also this work of being very attentive to oneself within the bigger environment and that demands a lot of work uh, for them. And something that I would like to turn uh, around because in the field of prosthetics and the field also of implants and disability, there's always this idea of visibility being stared at and being look looked at as different and how it's experienced as very distressing uh, for people. So here I'm going to turn through a different fieldwork, more to the question of resilience. How do people at some point do things that make them more resilient, able to cope, I don't like the term coping, but are able to sort of deal with the vulnerability, finding ways or finding techniques to make the body uh, more resilient, the body with the technology more resilient. And so this is the, 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 the term of, uh, I turn towards prosthetics, mostly lower limb prosthesis here. And I'm relying on a field work that has been done by uh, Valentin Gourina and how you can, and that's also relating more to the, the field. It's not cycling, but it's the field of sports. And um, so for people who have had an amputation, swimming is the most recommended sport. Um, it's generally the sport that's also practiced when you're in a rehabilitation center. Which, where it's called balneotherapy. And it's very good because the body does not carry itself. So there is no strain put on the joints. And it's a gentle yet effective muscular reinforcement for people. And also for a lot of them, that's the only place where they can also swim or do some things, be active without the prosthesis. And here we have um, Geneviève, 53. She's saying that since the amputation, I've been going a bit to the swimming pool, where at first I wasn't very comfortable in the water. That too have become comfortable over the years, also depending on the lifeguards who were there. And for me, the advantage of the pool is quite strong, since it's the only sport that I can do without a prosthesis. I then feel really free. And it is only in the water that I don't feel disabled, for example. And it's such a pleasure. It's really my element, water. So water is very good and for people that they feel very, very well and very nice in the water. However, how do we explain, or we were very surprised of Valentin when discussing it, how come that not many people actually go swimming? I'm sorry, this is quite small. And this is linked also to the fact that, um, that there are a lot more additional constraints to swimming. If you're in a rehabilitation center, you're with others with you, everything is set, or let's say the, the surroundings, the context, everything is, sh is made sure that you will not fall, that there are not too many difficulties. The majority of prosthetics are not adapted to the aquatic environment uh, or to sand. You should not put sand in your prosthetics or you should not put water on your fancy myoelectric prosthetics. That is really not something to do. So they have to leave, they have to arrive on the beach with crutches or they have to leave their prosthetics at the, at, on the edge of the pool. And the sand, the waves, how do you manage yourself when you're just on one leg to be able to go swim? And another thing is that then bodies are extremely or particularly exposed. There's no, there's no fabric to cover the lack, the amputated limb. Everybody can see it. So one can feel particularly uh, vulnerable. And here I found the two quotes very, um, well, very powerful, but very distressing too. So this is Geneviève again, 53, who loves swimming in water. And so she's saying, with a friend, we had gone to the south of France, to the seaside, and so I had a terrible urge to go swimming. I went there very, very early in the morning. 
when swimming at seven o'clock in the morning, when the beaches were relatively empty of people. I put my prosthesis aside, I went into the water and I was swinging, oh, I was fine. I'm here really free to move around in the water again. And then and there is a lady walking around who had come to walk her dog on the rocks. All of a sudden she must have seen, she must have seen me. She saw me and she saw what was missing and then she could not take her eyes off me and that was terrible to see that. You have then Claude who explains, he shocked me. He, went, he, he, he didn't go to the lakes often, but here he's talking about one particular experience. It shocked me. Whereas a few years before, I had dared once to go for a swim. I did go to a lake near my house and there was a riot. People were around me. It was the worst experience of my life, the exhibition of the beast. It was voyeurism. It wasn't mean either, but this on an amputee, it has a disastrous effect. It's a total loss of confidence. So because also of the violence of being exposed and vulnerable and people just see the vulnerability and gaze and stare, it's not even gazing, it's just staring with very questioning look and sometimes they don't even put, um, there's no limits in terms of even asking maybe very intrusive questions. Here the looks are very intrusive. This has indeed a disastrous effect on amputees. And so they adopt um, avoidance behaviors. So for instance, going to for a swim at seven in the morning when there's no one, or going to places that are very not accessible to people, gravel pits where they know they won't find many people. Or another avoidance uh, behavior is just to stop swimming. So that explains a bit why this is not a sport that's taken by, uh, by people. There's a rupture here again in terms of no longer, neither your body, not your body with the prosthesis is transparent and part of yourself all of a sudden is something that belongs to the world and that, uh, that attracts a lot of attention. On the contrary, we saw that uh, running and hiking are much riskier practices for amputees, lower limb amputees, but they are practices that are a lot more uh, taken on. It's, quite, it's the most popular sports among lower limb uh, amputees. So, for instance, here uh, Richard is talking about the risk of running. He says, I know, for example, that running is no longer possible because of the knee. It's too traumatic. There's too much impact on the knee, but it's a regret. I'd like to run. There in May, there, be, there will be races in Strasbourg. I dream of running with my all black prosthesis in shorts in the middle of the crown. It would be fun, wouldn't it? Maybe a bit exaggerated, but it's not, so, it's not far off. And it shows that it's not because you have a prosthesis that you can't run. And here, we just to talk about the risk, there's indeed, it's quite traumatic for the joints because of the repeated impacts, the running. And practices such as hiking and long walk will test also the amputee's feet and, and feet, muscles, and body endurance. But also because of the perspiration in the socket, you can have skin irritation and various injuries such as blisters, sores. And there's the risk of strains and um, or, or of injury because of, uh, of falls or sprains. And then if you have to be, in, you cannot move because you fell and maybe you busted your good knee, this is very much of a problem. So running and hiking are very, um, are difficult or are not the most advised sports, yet they're the most popular. Why are they the most popular? There's a bit of an explanation also, is the mediatic attention that uh, uh, running or people running, especially marathons or even uh, have been receiving. So these are a few, a few um, headlines of the French newspapers. So Morbihan, Amputé d'une jambe, il a couru le marathon de Paris avec une prothèse. All these kind of, these, um, these examples of people accomplishing extremely uh, long runs, extreme runs, and with uh, amputation. So it also has this kind of being able to go beyond themselves, and that's something that has received media coverage. So that can explain why it's also popular. But running is also a way, and running in particular context, I will say, and hiking is also a way through which people can gain knowledge of their prosthesis, or knowledge of what it feels to be wearing a prosthesis and to be able to master it or to make it part of their body and to be able to gain more knowledge and know-how about it. So um, here I'm talking the example, it's Valentine who did the field work in Strasbourg and she was looking at an association which is called the 3-4 A's Association and they organize treks in the Moroccan desert for people who have um, amputations lower limb amputations. And here they go back a bit about uh, their experience here. So for instance, um, Geneviève again is, now it's in 2013, so she's three years older and she's talking about the benefits are incredible. 
with the years, even before the treks, I had the impression that I, I had already gained a lot of things, a lot of abilities. But the first trek, it was extra extraordinary what it brought me, in a lot of ways, actually. Obviously, obviously a lot more self-confidence. The fact that I can test my body, put it to the test in a different way. Push it a little bit and feel the muscle in the effort. That's nice anyway. Reconciling also. After the image of the body was altered by the amputation, I was angry with my body. But thanks to that, I feel better in my body. So that, there's this idea also that by appealing to the capacities or to the, the, the limbs or the, yeah, the, the capacities walking and running here that was supposedly lost b during the amputation, there's this idea also of, of um, regaining control over oneself, of developing a certain mastery and reconciling, like she says, uh, with her body. But what we'll see is that it's also not just doing it alone, that's how people can create resilience. It's not just running or hiking alone that's very key. It's also running and hiking with others and in particularly safe context. So we'll go back on two things. The way that running and hiking can make people uh, getting to know better um, one's body with the prosthesis and also this idea of self-confidence. So here we have um, Adem, who's 35, and was, he's saying, I was already doing sports before I met the association, three, four, three, four, three, three A's. I was doing a lot of weight training and boxing with friends, but it wasn't easy because I didn't know the limit you can have with the prosthesis. There were often risks of falling. But since I went to Morocco, I have another relationship with my prosthesis. It has given me more confidence. I said to myself that it's not because you have a prosthesis that you have to be blocked in many things. It opened a lot of doors for me. So by also mobilizing the prosthesis in this particular context, they also built on the skills that um, they gained during the functional uh, rehabilitation, but they also learn new skills, new know-how, and they get that also by talking to others. Everybody during the treks is in the same situation. So for some people say, well, actually to avoid blisters, this is what you should be doing. These are not things that they tell you necessarily in a rehabilitation facility. It's after it's learning by yourself or learning on your own that you get to know that. And here with having others, you also learn in a very safe environment because there's a team behind with uh, a Jeep being able to, or even horses, to be able to carry people if they cannot walk anymore. But also these exchanges of knowledge and uh, know-how. It's also easing a bit use practices and appropriation. So here it's um, Hélène who's 61 years old and she says, so for me it was great because I've never done anything in my life. So it was a very beautiful experience, very exotic. I went on treks in 2004, 2008, and 2011. And to think that for 44 years I had done nothing, it changed me. It's really great for me to have gotten to know this association. I've made so much progress since then, and it's really much better. Even when I'm not with them, when I'm at home, well now I continue to make efforts to walk, to train, etc. I'm really happy, I'm really happy to be able to be with them because I understand that it's important and I want to keep in shape. So the tracks, this experience with others is also um, an impulse to use and to appropriate one's prosthesis. It makes her here continue the practice of sports, which is very important because the body of, a, of an amputated person, of an amputee, also ages a lot faster than an able body because you put a lot more strain on the control lateral leg, for instance. And it's also this, like I was saying, this importance of, a, of learning for others. So here are the benefits, in a way, the existential benefits that people gain from running or from hiking outweigh, outweigh a lot the risks of falling or of having uh, injuries. And this is also this idea of self-confidence. So it's Adem again who talks about the fact that what we gain in these hikes is mostly self-confidence. Because when you are in Morocco, you go down mountains, you climb rocks, you cross a sand desert, you walk on all kinds of surfaces. And when you go home, you say to yourself, now I can do whatever I want because I've made it, I've made it through all of this. I've been able to do everything. And also it was admirable to see all the other people, amputees who were more or less amputated than me, who gave this impulse to see these people, despite their disability, feel good and comfortable with their disability. So in terms of the self-confidence, this particular setting, the fact that you're doing, you're practicing a sport that also enables you to gain more knowledge over your body, but also is very inspiring because you also see others who have maybe, if you're a, a, lower, a lower knee or amputated on the knee and you see somebody who's amputated over and also able to do it, it's very inspiring. But it's also a very safe environment 
there's nobody around like at the swimming pool looking and um, checking or making them feel less about themselves. So this is why these kind of safe, safe spaces are very important for them to build resilience and to build knowledge and uh, know-how. There's also something that, um, that was striking in this fieldwork is that for a lot of them, they also like to show their prosthesis or to run in able-bodied race, uh, races. It's not just to once run amongst themselves, so people who also have similar experience and disability, but also to go show what they're capable of in front of others. So here it's a Fatih, 43, and he says, able-bodied race are super stimulating. I'm in the middle of the group. I'm not first, but I'm happy because I'm not last. So that makes me proud. And thanks to that, I have the impression that today I managed to, get, to regain the place that I had before. At least they, so able-bodied people, they no longer wonder, can he do it? Is he going to make it? Today the question no longer arises, they forgot everything, because I made them forget everything. So there is this idea also that sporting, and generally when they go sports or running in able-bodied race, the prosthesis is not hidden. That was also at the beginning where, I don't know if it was Richard or who was talking about the fact that he dreams about running with those all black prosthesis and showing what he's able to be, what he's able to do. And here this is also this idea of, of it has a bit of an activist or political um, um, position, which is to show others that it's not because you have a disability that you are worthless or less able than others. And this has been gained, this kind of resilience, also through, well, sporting or doing things with others who have a similar disability and in a safe space. So maybe it's, for me, that's also when I was thinking of what you're doing here um, with the, the sports center, Maybe the attraction also of it is that all of a sudden you're in a space in which people share also in the experience, exchange knowledge, and there's not this questioning, these constant questions or um, intruding and intrusive gaze of others wondering, is he going to fall? Is he going to succeed? What does it feel? Or sometimes also asking questions without wondering if it's hurtful for people. Um, so yeah, they, they also like to confront uh, non-amputees and to show off a bit that, uh, and, and to, to insist on the merit of their performance. And I will stop on that. For me, the, some points that I wanted to raise is that there's work, a lot of work that is required to be able to, uh, I'm missing a word, to live well with an implanted or prosthetic technology. That's not something that is done just like that at one's will. It really takes work, effort, and it's never something absolute. You embody it, you incorporate it, it feels nice, but it can rupture, there can be disruptions because all of a sudden you interact with the airport security or metallic gate or you have people look, look at you at, in a weird way and that also can completely reverse the experience. And sports here, especially for, um, in, the, in the field of prosthetics, was a way of building resilience, of trusting and uh, reappropriating their body and sensations and also gain knowledge and know-how. And I think here's something that is key, the importance of safe spaces away from intrusive gaze and that enable to learn from and with others. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions. I have uh, neurological pain all the time. <coughs> I know what the, everything you, you were talking about. I wear these gloves all the time simply because I can't stand not wearing them. Because when I touch, it's hypersensitive to my fingers. It's like having my hands outside and I'm freezing, and then I go back inside with warm water and the sting that is there, it's always there. Um, so I've, I experience it constantly. Uh, sometimes I can't get out of bed. Um, uh, all, all of these things that you've said are true and uh, I can relate to them. Uh, I, would, I would additionally add that sometimes uh, being here today uh, takes my distraction away from my pain mm -hmm. and you almost forget it because you're doing something else. So there's a hierarchy in the thought process or importance I think that um, allows you to cope with your pain um, which is interesting. You can decide to stay in bed because the pain's too much, or you can just slap yourself and you say, get out of bed, because I know that I'll be distracted and the pain will be better, um, which goes back to meditation and uh, self-hypnosis, uh, which weren't mentioned, but uh, those are two things that I think that um, people 
with neurological pain um, need to master. Um, and I think that's a very important piece of that. Of course, the social acceptance thing is something that each person has to do with their own too. But um, my, my, my one thing is that I've realized staying in bed is one of the worst things I can do. And if I can prevent it, I need to, not only because I need to move, mm -hmm. but also because of my mental state that I'm in, uh, I, I, my attention comes off the pain. Mm -hmm. And so bringing, bringing about situations where there is not that pain is, is, is very important. To comment, I don't have really a question, but I suppose you've experienced that. Yeah. No, but that's also the way that also the way pain is being addressed <coughs> by the medical world also has changed to, or there are different ways, but this is something that is indeed emerging in terms of to try to take the focus away from it in a way as much as possible, whether meditation or whether um, indeed hypnosis. I've talked to a person also who had uh, multiple sclerosis, and she's an artist, and she was saying, well. The moment that I actually make art, I don't feel the sensation that I have. I feel that generally they're pouring water on my leg. She has strange sensations and she says, when I'm in the flow, I do not feel my body anymore. So I think there is indeed that would be interesting to see what is at play here. I've seen so that happen with sport too. Yeah. And I think there's, there's also a chemical biological thing going on with mm -hmm. the endorphin release too. But uh, yeah, I, I found, and that's, you said that with the running, it's because of the, the publicity. I think a big part of the running is that it's much easier. Not everybody has a swimming pool. Yeah. And there is uh, anything that can get the cardiovascular going, and you have to get the cardiovascular going, I think, mm. to really get that um, endorphin release. Mm. And then you, 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 you get the runner's high, you get the zone. Anybody who's in sports knows what I'm talking about. Um, and so I think that's very important. I and mean, that's actually physical chemical. Mm -hmm. too. So it's not just mental, so, um, which I think is an important aspect of that. Too. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for your spark, your speakers. I would like to bounce on one of your slides where you mention uh, people swimming, going swimming, and then uh, feeling that they are the attraction, like the, the yeah, showing the beast, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was quite surprised uh, from both sides in mean, the fact that people would stare and the fact that it would be a real distress uh, for the people. Um, actually, it made me think of um, a guy that was at the Robert Potter's conference. Mm -hmm. He said that um, at first he used to have um, a prosthesis that would almost look like a yeah. normal leg. Mm -hmm. uh, but then people would stare and they're like, well, what's wrong? And until they get it. So he decided to just wear uh, like weird fancy prosthesis and then they will really, oh it's a prosthesis okay mm -hmm. we'll stop looking so i'm curious to you I mean, you have any insight of understanding um, um, what's the reason for people to either uh, be embarrassed or stand for uh, the differences well there is the I don't know if I will answer directly to the question, but in terms of this kind of moment of, oh, is it some, there's the uncanny valley, this idea that, oh, it looks like a real arm, but it's not a real arm. And I remember talking to, uh, it was upper limb amputees this time, so, and one said, well, I've never felt disabled in my life, actually, there was never something, but people made me feel disabled when they were looking at my prosthesis, there was, there was something wrong. And at some point he decided, said, since if it's normal looking one, it will never be looking like the real thing. I'll always get comments. So now he's wearing his, um, his prosthesis without the, um, without the cosmesis over it. That's generally is there to match the skin tone, but that you have to think also of which skin tone you have in the summer and in the winter. So there you have two. There's just a side comment. But. And he was saying that for him, this was actually, the experience was a lot better because it attracted, paradoxically, it attracted a lot less comments because then there was no, there was nothing that was, it was strange from the get-go because people could see that this was a prosthesis. And in terms of the asking, I don't know. There is always a question. I, in terms of, a, of, of, of people's reaction to bodily difference, there is also, uh, Perrin was talking about this idea, of, this idea of ableism. We're a very ableist society where you have to be a certain way to be able to be able, or to, to, to that's a bit, that you have to look a certain way, you have to be standing on two legs, you have to have two arms. There is also this idea of, uh, of that. I can't explain 
I don't know what's the process. You find it rude, right? Somebody would say, what happened to you? Or to stare very strongly. So I do not know if it's maybe a fear of the fact that that would happen, or it's just fascination, or it's, I do not know. Can that I have no. Back to what Perrine was saying about engineers, that wants to uh, put people back on the legs. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's maybe not what, maybe, no. it's maybe not the top priority. No. Um, and you said something interesting, it's that people, made them disabled or look disabled. Um, uh, made me think of the uh, how we define handicap. Mm -hmm. And we could define it as a pathology of society that um, doesn't allow you to, uh, to do the same things as uh, everyone. Well, that's in the disability studies field, you have indeed this thing, this take on. So we have the medical model, the biomedical model, that sees bodily difference as deficient, and we need to fix it. So if somebody, then we need to make somebody stand and walk again. That's the, and that's disability is the bodily deficient, or the, the impairment. Impairment is the bodily deficient. And then you have the social model of disability that was also created by, uh, by disabled scholars and saying, but actually, it's, it's not my body that makes me disabled, it's the social environment. I'm in a wheelchair, if I have an elevator in front of me, I am not disabled, I can go somewhere. If I don't have a pavement, I don't see how I'm limited in my experience. But yeah, sure, give me a flight of stairs in front of the building, then I'm a bit, there's a bit of a problem. And for a lot of people, there was that also, this social model. Then there is a new, a third a way, but saying, yeah, okay, but you still need to be able to account for what happens for people the way they experience their body. So to also think of this idea of body difference. So not just to think and to say, oh, disability is only relying with the, the, the society. People can also be disabled because at some point there is a, a real experience of maybe carrying a, a stomy, I don't know how it's called, a stomy pocket, or, um, oh, yeah. when, or, or that you have to have particular medication, or that you also have some particular experience of your body. So it's to be able to account for both. But there is a, 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 a real experience in here is that society makes people disabled. If you make sure that your environment is accessible for everybody, whether you're uh, visually impaired or, uh, or auditory impaired or functionally impaired or you have a, a deficiency, but you have access, there's no more disability to talk about because you're still able to do the same thing as everybody else in the room. And have you ever witnessed people switching from, from being embarrassed about their disability to some kind of pride, uh, or the other way around, maybe. And uh, if so, can you identify what would be the cause of this? That I don't know. What I, I see is that a lot of people, in terms of identify, are no longer seeing themselves as disabled. It's also sometimes rec with prosthetics, for instance, it works a lot more because you can customize it. So you will start having people who have uh, lower limb prosthesis and will start having it look like it's a tattoo or have particular drawings, they also make it, and then they expose it. That's also that's something that looks like a piece of art or customization, like you would wear fashion in a particular way. And for them, that's a way of reclaiming and kind of returning the, the stigma, in a way, that all of a sudden, okay, there is something missing, for sure, but it's here, it's there, I'm showing it, and then all of a sudden, it loses a bit the symbolic take that it has. For some of them, that was that. I cannot explain, I do not know what, I would have to do a lot more interviews and ask people particularly in terms of that, that experience. And I do not know either in terms of the other effects, like all of a sudden not feeling disabled and then one day to experience it. But I think in lots of ways, people are talking also about how indeed the, the, the social material environment and especially the norms that we have of what constitutes like a normal human being are what is experienced as symbolically quite violent and would make people feel less than others. There's that that comes back, the valuation that society gives to a particular body in comparison with others. If we just broaden the, the spectrum, can we make a parallel between being uh, having a handicap um, and just being part of a minority? Because uh, maybe uh, like the wrong passport or the wrong skin color could be a handicap uh, if you're at the wrong place. I don't know, because yet again, the bodily experience is not the same. There is, a, in terms of bodily abilities, this is not comparable. Some people are still talking, there's one scholar, she talks about misfits. So the idea that you might fit or not fit with your environment, and that's how you can experience disability. And she says, well, 
if you're a woman and you're entering into a board of miso misogynistic men, you will feel that there is a misfit. All of a sudden, you feel a bit at odd. That's the same if you're a, a black person or, or in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a room full of races. There will be a moment when, but I don't think there is a misfit. That's how she calls it. There is, and you can also think about how the body fits or not fits in particular situation. But I still think when it, it, turn, it has to do with disability, sometimes we forget about the body and we can't put everything on an equal grounding. There is something that there's an experience that is different, bodily speaking, in terms of being not feeling pain, not feeling tired, not seeing one's body as the, the center of one's attention. Even though then you could say yes, but if you're a black person in a, in a, in a white society, you also feel that you're struck out, that you're very visible or highly visible, so that can also be. But I think there's this very strong bodily experience that might also be key here and that needs to be accounted for when talking about disability. Because mm -hmm. we can't put everything on the same level and then say, well, because then you also invisibilize the experience of the ones who are considered to be disabled if you put everybody on the same settings. I think the key is education. When young kids are used to see people with prosthetics with, in a wheelchair, it, it's just normal. And when you go to classes with, with Amin and with Zulia and you explain them how it works and they do, they race with a, a special uh, a wheelchair or, or they try things, it's just become normal. normal. And kids then will educate their parents. Mm. That takes time. But that's the thing. But it's true that because at some point for people, for instance, wearing prosthesis, you don't want to, it can be very distressing to attract attention. So you tend to hide the disability. So you do not see, for instance, many people walking with their prosthesis. Some places are not accessible with people in wheelchairs. So you do not see particular bodies in particular, particular places. And it's true that education, if all of a sudden it becomes something that is seen, recognized, and not seen as different, there is. That's the key here, but that's something that takes a long time, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions, I... Oh. <coughs> As uh, Vance would say, just a comment. That was uh, the first time for me that I uh, assisted at uh, a conference with an uh, interview. And uh, so I was uh, uh, very interested and I, so I was wondering... Uh, so it's not only interview, it's... it's uh, each, each time you put the text, there are two colors. So it seems yeah. that you make a, a selection yourself. So, so I was wondering if there would be, uh, let's say, uh, something that would be, uh, because you put part of your mind in the color selection. So mm -hmm. Something objective. To highlight say, particular things. So, yeah. Something objective that, let's say, recognize in the different interviews that you have done, that there is a common point uh, of the... It's the way when you do interviews and then when you analyze them, you code them. So for instance, you read and reread and reread your interviews and you start to code them thematically speaking. Wait, so then, but, but what do you select? Things that come back repeatedly or? Well, generally, yeah, for them to matter, they need to come back in particular to be able to not generalize, but to see that there are similar patterns similar experiences and to be able to make a point mm. that there are things that indeed com come back in people's experience and that's why you and then you can refine and see that okay we have similar experiences but then there are particular nuances and what makes what then is the cause of this nuance of this particular I don't know if I'm very clear but indeed we code we see how also things can connect what can be the explanatory um so in fact what you see is that the bubble or not in fact subjective they are objective in the sense that you have seen them repeatedly yeah and so, okay. that's internal validation in a way that you see that I don't like the expression of till saturation of data so you keep seeing the same thing coming back in the interviews mm -hmm. but generally that's what people try to achieve and um Oh, I missed uh, what I wanted to say. I'm sorry. No, no, um, it's okay. It, this means that if you give the same set of interview to a student, for example, a new field, yeah. they, will, uh, they will recognize the same problem. Yeah. Uh, yes, because not only you do internal validation, but you work with a team. So many people are also looking at it. And when a social scientists, for instance, publish, you have to make sure that you have access to the transcripts. Mm -hmm. Because someone might say, well, okay, I want to read if it's actually true, if you're making things up. That's our data collection, 
and you generally are not the only one looking at it. You also discuss it, you cross-reference it with other researchers, and, and, and you don't present something that is just a, a coincidental uh, finding. Yeah. It's like sharing your, the raw data. Yeah. <laughs> Any last comment, last questions? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your attention. I would like to thank you very much for You're welcome. Thanks for having me.